Hey, so this is a walkthrough of a mathematical framework for, a mathematical framework for transformer circuits. This is an experimental idea, shamelessly stolen from Nick Camerata, where I take a paper, a mathematical framework for transformer circuits, and I stream myself scrolling through it and generally giving a bunch of thoughts, like things I think are confusing, bits I think are particularly exciting, why the fuck this paper even exists in the first place, and yeah, I don't know, there's lots of stuff that just doesn't really fit in the paper format, but which I think is pretty useful to know. Um, this is an experiment, so feedback is extremely welcome, whether of the form this was great and completely changed how I saw the paper, to this was terrible, to your audio quality was so bad it ruined an otherwise excellent experience for me. And yeah, here goes. So, first, just a bit of high-level framing. Um, I worked on this paper when I worked with the interpretability team at Anthropic under Chris Ola. I have since left, but this is probably the coolest paper, in my opinion, that I've ever been involved in, so I'm excited to give a bunch of thoughts about it. Um, but accordingly, this is very much my own personal views, rather than the views of any future or past employer, or views that I think anyone else on the team would necessarily endorse. And yeah, this is mostly going to be my takes as someone who thinks a lot about transformer circuits and cares a lot about it. Um, while I am an author on this paper, the vast majority of the credit goes to Chris, Nelson, Nelson, Catherine, and the rest of Anthropic. But yes, caveats aside, let us jump into a mathematical framework for transformer circuits. Let's move this over here so I can see the contents page. But yeah, so maybe a good place to start would just be, why does this paper exist? What is it trying to do? What is the point? And in my eyes, the point is, we are trying to do mechanistic interpretability. Mechanistic interpretability is taking a language model, no, taking a neural network, language or otherwise, and saying, I do not believe this is a fucked up, uninterpretable black box. I believe that this is actually learned some human interpretable algorithms. It's got some internal coherence that makes sense. But because we didn't train it to expose that internal coherence to us, by default it's a black box. Mechanistic interpretability is about taking this black box and trying to reverse engineer it and like decompile it into some actual human understandable algorithm. And I think this is incredibly important, both because this is just like objectively incredibly cool and interesting, because we have models that can do things and then we can reverse engineer them and see how they do what they do, and this is fucking awesome. But I also think this is just like actually really important from an alignment and safety point of view, because if you actually buy claims around we're gonna live in a world which has which is increasingly being shaped by increasingly a powerful AI, I sure would like to be able to understand what those things are doing beyond just observing their inputs and outputs. Um, a thing which I think is particularly exciting from mechanistic interpretability is the ability to actually tell the difference between the model outputs this for reason A, like it want, genuinely wants to do what humans want it to do, and the model outputs the same thing for reason B, such as it realized that telling us what you want to hear is the best way to get reward. And these are quite different, and I would love to be able to look inside a model and figure out what's up. So, yes, that is mechanistic interpretability. The, uh, this paper is one of the first mechanistic interpretability of large language models, in particular transformers papers. And in my opinion, this is just the most exciting thing to currently be doing mechanistic interpretability on, because A, I think that large language models are the most likely thing to get us human level AI, um, but also B, uh, it is just a fact about the world that there exist computer programs like GPT-3 that can basically speak English at a human level, and no one knows how they work, and no one knows how to write a program that does this from scratch. 
and I'm just like, what? This is not an acceptable state of the world. I want to understand what the hell is going on. And mechanistic interpretability of large language models is trying to do this. So, yeah. And this paper is kind of an interesting mix of a bunch of maths and linear algebra and theory and a bunch of actual empirical study of real models where... So the core goal is to outline a framework for how do you even start doing mechanistic interpretability of transformers? And this is kind of a weird question. Um, like, what does that even mean? So, to my eyes, the core problem that you need to solve to have any hope in hell of doing mechanistic interpretability is being able to solve the curse of dimensionality. Being able to take these weird, intricate, high-dimensional objects of neural networks um, from, I don't know, something like ImageNet to the 540 billion parameter monstrosity that is Palm, and break them down into bits that can be understood semi-independently and are, like, much, much smaller, because I do not have the capacity to understand 540 billion independently varying floating points. That just sounds completely fucked. And... Yeah. But, a priori, it's not obvious how you do this, what ways are principled, what ways are just kind of messed up. Um, this is building on a bunch of prior work done by Chris and his team at OpenAI on image circuits, where the fundamental object they focused on was neurons. This kind of works in transformers, but works less well. And then there's a bunch of objects in transformers that just don't have analogs to image models, like attention layers, the residual stream, embeddings. What's up with that? And yeah, the core framework outlined in this paper mostly focuses, mostly skips over the uh, multi-layered perceptron part of Transformers because it's really annoying and messy and we don't claim we have great ways of thinking about it, and focuses on uh, attention-only Transformers because A, this is way easier, and B, attention is the main weird new thing that's been introduced above vanilla neural networks, and tries to break down how to understand this. And the core thing is these, the model is made up of attention layers, these attention layers are built up of several heads, the heads can be thought of as working in parallel, um, and each head is kind of a interesting object to try to independently understand on its own. And there's a bunch of other insights for how to think about things that I'll get to as I skim through. But that's enough pontificating, and I should start actually going through the paper. Um, yep, so this is a bunch of general context and flavor. Um, yeah, so what this is about is there's kind of two halves to this paper. Uh, one half is a mathematical framework for just how do you reason about transformers, or at least attention early transformers? Like, what is the algebra? How does it break down? And how should you fit this into your head as some, like, conceptual thing to think about? And then the second half is we trained some tiny attention early transformers on real language data and then went and interpreted them. And we both present this as, like, it is just kind of intrinsically interesting to actually understand the real model, but also these are just a pretty good place to actually both teach and explain, but also empirically demonstrate and validate the various pontifications we make in our framework. And I've been pretty pleasantly surprised by how well the take tiny toy models, try to understand them, and then carefully and reason in a principled way about how these insights could transfer to real models has actually worked. Uh, 
a priori, I would probably not have predicted this. I think it's gone pretty great. Um, I gather anecdotally that Chris has tried things like um, interpreting tiny models trained on MNIST uh, in image stuff, and this just basically didn't work, and the larger the models got, the more interpretable they seemed to be. Uh, this seems not to be the case in Transformers, and it's kind of wild. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's at all obvious a priori that this was the correct thing to do, but it seems to have worked. And yeah, at a very high level, um, we do, we look at zero layer transformers, which are exactly as trivial as they sound, but I think are a good illustration of some of the important ideas here. Uh, we look at one layer attentionally transformers that are like, actually kind of interesting, um, where the main thing to focus on here is understanding the functional form of attention and what it can easily represent and what it can't easily represent. Um, and we see that the main exciting thing that comes up that we not, might not have expected is skip trigrams, which are basically the model learns sequences of the form um, if I see A followed by a big gap and then a token B, I predict the token C will come next. That was kind of weird and abstract, so I should probably get an example. A good example might be um, the phrase, keep in mind. Um, if you see in, it's kind of hard to figure out what should come next. Um, but if you know that the word keep comes before it, then mind is a lot more likely to come next. It's surprisingly hard for a transformer to learn um, a trigram like this. Like, if heap followed by in, then mind. Um, there are a bunch of complicated reasons behind this, but the core thing is that from the perspective of a transformer, every position is kind of symmetric, apart from a kludge called positional embeddings that we kind of shove on top. And this means it's hard to tell the difference between keep somewhere before in and keep immediately before in. Um, so it instead learns the skip trigram of keep somewhere before in, in, then mind is likely to come next. And just getting your head around what's going on here and why this is natural, I think is the main takeaway to get from the one layer section. Um, two layer attention only transformers are way more interesting than one layer ones because you actually have composition. You have heads in the first layer, heads in the second layer, and the inputs to heads in the second layer include heads in the first layer. And this means you can actually get way more interesting functions. And I don't know, composition is like the entire point of deep learning. Like there are random theorems that technically a two-layer MLP can do everything. But in practice, we study deep learning, not wide learning. Uh, and the reason we do this is uh, deeper models have depth, and depth means you can have a bunch of composition. And fundamentally, the way I generally think about neural networks is they are the incredibly simple function of matrix multiplication with like a tiny veneer of nonlinear things on top. And as you compose these simple but not quite linear functions, you go from, yeah, what I'm representing is basically a linear map, to, huh, what I'm representing is actually kind of a interesting series composing a bunch of things with some, with just a lot of room to express interesting things. And also, it's just a lot easier to conceptually understand when the model is doing something complicated by composition than when the model is doing something complicated via some, like, random fucked up thing. So, yeah. Composition. And the main example of interesting composition is induction heads, which are fucking wild, and I'll get to them later. But yeah. Um, zero layer transformers, very easy, briefly outline what is the core framework here. One layer, uh, mildly more interesting, they can do some things very well and some things pretty badly, 
and paying attention to this is a good way to really grok what is an attention head and what's going on there. And two layer, the point is now you introduce composition. And composition is fundamental and interesting and weird and getting how it works is important. Yes. Um, conceptual takeaways. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to... Yeah, so... A thing which is kind of annoying about this paper is... This paper is about... How you act, you should, in some sense, think about Transformers. Um, and this kind of relies on someone already having an existing understanding of Transformers for us to riff off of and give our take. And um, if you're reading this because you've heard about how cool mechanistic acceptability is, but don't really know what a Transformer is, this is kind of confusing. Um, and this is not really the right venue for me to actually try to explain what a Transformer is. But I'm going to skim through the Transformer Overview section and see if there are just, like, brief overview that I can usefully give. Um, so, yeah. Two, uh, one meta note is Transformers are weirdly linear. And one consequence of being weirdly linear is that there are lots of ways to represent equivalent concepts um, in the same way that, like... If I want to take the product of 3 times 4 times 5, taking brackets 3 times 4 times 5 is the same as taking 3 times, open brackets, 4 times 5. Um, and, except way more interesting and less trivial. And uh, it turns out that when you let ML people choose the best way to represent things, they think about how do I write this in code such that it's really computationally efficient? And that makes sense, because if you're spending millions of dollars on a model, you want to do it efficiently, and also you don't want to wait ages for your code to run. But there's kind of no reason you would think that the optimal thing for computational efficiency is also the optimal thing for human understanding. And a lot of what we're doing in this paper is saying, yeah, no, uh, there's actually a better way of thinking about it from a human interpretable point of view. Um, so, yes, a lot of what I'm going to say might differ from existing descriptions of Transformers which you've heard before, and yes, uh, this is kind of why. Lots of things are mathematically equivalent. Um, but, yes, so what the hell is a Transformer? Uh, very briefly, the fundamental point of a transformer is to be a sequence prediction machine. Uh, you've got a sequence, and you want a model which can take in sequences of varying length, and both do a bunch of computation in parallel on each element of your sequence, but also um, be able to move information between sequence positions in an intelligent way. The main models we're going to focus on are uh, GPT-2 style models, uh, of which the jargon we give is uh, autoregressive, meaning that they are models that kind of um, have input and produce input based on that, and then produce more input based on the previous input and the thing they just output. Um, I think, I could be wrong, recursive, recursion-y stuff. And decoder only, which basically means um, we, our model just kind of goes one way, where each token only looks backwards, and we produce things that are kind of going forwards. Um, yes, this is in contrast to uh, encoders, where tokens can look in either direction and stuff can move wherever. Uh, I believe BERT is an encoder model. Um, and the original paper was about translation models, we had an encoder-decoder structure, but that's totally irrelevant and we're not going to think about it. And yeah, um, high level, the, trans the model takes in this sequence of tokens, um, we take natural language and we convert it to tokens in a way that is completely messy and completely fucked 
and incredibly annoying if you're trying to do interpretability, but yeah, gotta live with it. Um, but the outshot of that is that we just got this vocabulary of like 50,000 tokens, and each element in the sequence is um, a number in that list, 1 to 50,000. Um, we then want to convert this to um, this internal representation called the embedding, um, which I kind of think of as the residual stream. Um, and what we basically do is we learn a big lookup table called uh, WE, the embedding weights, where every token maps to a vector in this embedded space. Um, it's useful to have numbers on things, so I am going to say that the vocabulary is size 50,000, and the embedding is size 1,000. So we've got a lookup table, every token maps to a 1,000 dimensional embedding vector, uh, that's x0. Um, we generally also want to add in some fudge, which lets us represent which position things are in the sequence, because by default, from the Transformers perspective, every position is just kind of symmetric. And yeah, um, the way, the classic way of doing this, which is the way I normally think about, um, says let's just take a uh, another matrix uh, called W pause, which basically acts like a embedding for position matrix, and W pause has size uh, D model, which is the embedding size, uh, against the context length. Um, I apologize for my atrocious handwriting. Uh, writing on a trackpad is suboptimal, and I should probably get a graphics tablet. Um, but yes. So, yeah, um, we somehow represent positions, uh, then we have this attention layer. And so a key thing to have in your head, which this diagram doesn't do a very good job of showing, is that x0 is actually a tensor of uh, a embedding size vector at every position in the sequence. Um, and you can kind of think of there being a uh, stream running in parallel um, for each of the positions. Um, and then each layer is applied on each position kind of symmetrically. And yes, we've got attention layers. The point of an attention layer is to move information between token positions and do some processing along the way. And we've got an MLP layer. The point of the MLP layer is to do a bunch of processing on each token position in parallel, but not moving information between positions. And the output of both the attention layer and the MLP layer is just added on to this central object called the residual stream, where the residual stream starts as the embedded tokens. We then add on the output of the first attention layer. We then add on the output of the first MLP layer and we just like keep going. So it's the accumulated sum of every output so far. I will touch on why you might think this is sensible a bit later. And then at the end of the model, we want to convert from this nice representation of a embedding size or demodel size vector in each position to tokens. Uh, we do this by just a linear map, multiplying by this unembedding matrix, which is uh, takes a demodel thing from the residual stream and maps it to a devocab thing. So it's a 1,000 to 50,000 matrix map. Um, a kind of weird thing about um, GPT-2-style transformers is that they actually output a um, position by devocab tensor. So every position in the sequence has a vector across the entire vocabulary, a vector of logits, and uh, this is kind of weird uh, because naively 
the thing we're trying to do is predict the next token. Um, in order to predict, to predict the next token, the only thing you care about is the final position. Why do we calculate something at everything? And this basically happens uh, because of an artifact of how the model is trained. Um, we train the model to take in a bunch of text, and then kind of for every prefix of that text, the models the model can only ever see tokens that came at that position or earlier. And then so at the very end, the thing you get out is a vector of logits over the prediction for the next token. The model knows what the next token is, but it wasn't allowed to see it because of this decodery prefix structure. And so if every token outputs a vector of logits predicting what the next token will be, uh, this means you can give your model um, a thousand times as many data points for every string you give it. And this is kind of useful. Um, mm, this is a useful fact about transformers from the perspective of trying to use it to, say, generate text. It's not obviously all that useful, but whatever. Um, so, one... Hmm, do I want to talk about this, or do I want to go through the conceptual overviews? Yeah, I want to talk about this. Um, so... So, this central line, the residual stream, is like really, really, really important. Um, it's... In some... I normally think about transformers as having this central object of this, like, big, wide residual stream carrying forward all of the information of the network. And each layer, uh, the... Um, just kind of reading in information from the residual stream, applying some edits, and then putting it back. Uh, putting it back with just, like, some edits and, like, nudging what's in the stream a bit and adding in some new information. And... A weird but really useful fact about Transformers is that we will only ever read and write from the Transformer, from the residual stream, with linear operations. Um, addition and just applying a linear map to read out from it, uh, to get the input to a layer. And this is really, really important because it means that you can think of the residual stream as being the sum of the output of every layer. And this means you can decompose the input 20 layer into a sum of a bunch of terms which correspond to different bits of the network. And this is a really big deal, as we'll see later. Um, and... The... Yeah. And... So, the way I basically think about this is that the model... Yeah, so the model is trying to perform a bunch of computation. Um, the computation will often involve information flowing from the input to the output, likely via some layers. Like, the token is read by some head, the head moves it to some other position of the sequence, and then that gets uh, pushed up through another head, which gets processed by an MLP layer, which then maps the unembed. Uh, to the output logits. Um, and one of the reasons the residual stream is a really important object is it means that rather than every such path needing to go through every single layer of the network, the model can choose which layers it wants to go through and otherwise just go through this residual connection. And in practice, it seems to be the case that most of the computation the model is doing just goes via a couple of bits of the model, and like a couple of layers, rather than going through everything. And the residual stream is really important because it gives the model the freedom to do this, and to choose kind of what paths it wants to send information down. And uh, there are a couple of really important implications of this residual stream as a sum of paths. Um, model functionality as a sum of paths via the residual stream notion. Um, the first important implication is that this means that 
we should expect a lot of the model's behavior to be kind of localized. Like there's going to be some path through the model which goes through some heads and some MLPs and gets to the output. Um, and we might predict that a bunch of behavior basically looks like some paths matter and most paths don't matter. And in practice this basically seems to be the case. Um, implication 2. Um, the model is using the residual stream uh, to kind of achieve composition between different bits of it. Like there'll be some head in this layer which composes with some head in the next layer. And kind of by composes, what this basically means is the head in the first layer will output some vector to the residual stream, the head in the second layer will take as an input the entire residual stream, but mostly focus on the output of the head in the first layer, and then do some stuff with it. And you can kind of think of the output of this head as being some encoded message read in by the second head. Um, but importantly, for any pair of composing bits in the model, they are completely free to choose their own encoding. Um, there's no reason that the encoding for the communication between head 0 in layer 0 and head 5 in layer 3 should be the same as the encoding between head 2 in layer 0 and head 3 in layer 1. And this means that we should expect the residual stream to be pretty difficult to interpret. And this, in practice, is the case. It's really messy and really hard to interpret. Um, and this is an annoying fact about the world. Um, and the way we deal with this is that rather than, hmm, rather than taking the kind of natural approach to interpretability of transformers, where we say, okay, the model is kind of a series of tensors where you apply a layer and you get a new tensor out, and every tensor should be individually interpretable. What we actually say is, understanding the residual stream seems completely fucked. Instead, I'm going to try to identify which paths through the model matter, and then try to decompose a path into bits between parts of the model that I expect to be interpretable. And um, so, for example, if there's a path that goes from the token embedding through one MLP layer to the unembedding, there's a path from the embedding to, that M to the activations of the MLP. That path is just a series of linear maps, and you might expect that to be interpretable, and hopefully that's interpretable and you can interpret these activations, and then there's a path from the MLP to the unembed, and hopefully you can interpret how the map from those activations to the unembed is meaningful and interpretable. And importantly, if you can do this, because everything is linear, you don't actually care about understanding what the residual stream in the middle means. And this is good, because the residual stream is this sum of all of these weird encoded messages between all of the different bits of the network, and it's a total mess. Um, another way of phrasing it, which is an important but often pretty confusing idea, is this idea of a privileged basis. Um, so, and the claim that the residual stream does not have a privileged basis, which makes it pretty hard to interpret. The so what do I mean by a privileged basis? So fundamentally, if you have a vector space, you, you're going to need a basis to try to understand what's going on inside it. Some way to decompose vectors into coefficients of a bunch of fixed coordinate axes. And uh, there are a bunch of techniques for taking an arbitrary set of vectors and finding a basis that might be sensible for those, like principal component analysis. Um, but it would be really nice if we can take a model and just a priori say um, what is going on. And a priori say, um, yeah, um, what is the right basis? Because then interpreting the model goes from interpreting this 
uh, enormous fucked up mess of weights and activations that's really hard to get your head around to a bunch of numbers. And we expect each number is hopefully in independently meaningful, independent of the other things. Um, this is often not the case, um, but there are some bits of the model where we are more likely to have a privileged basis, and other bits where we are less likely to. And yeah, just to be super clear, by privileged basis we mean we can predict a priori, without explicitly looking at the weights or activations, which basis of vectors might be meaningful. And with my mathematician hat on, it's kind of weird that we might ever expect a basis to be privileged. Uh, vector spaces are geometric objects. The coordinate axes are just total arbitrary nonsense. And you need something special to think that there's a privileged basis. And importantly, you need something non-linear. And because everything interacting with the residual stream is linear, there's no reason the residual stream should have a privileged basis. Um, we're not making... And this isn't really us making the claim that there's something special about the residual stream. This is us making the claim that all vector spaces by default do not have a privileged basis, and the residuals and other bits of the model might, but only because they have nonlinearities. Um, concretely, if you look at the things inside the model, the things that I assert actually have a privileged basis are the input tokens, duh, the vocabulary, the effort logits, duh, the vocabulary, MLP activations, kind of, though this is a total mess. You should go read the fourth Transformer Circuits paper called The Toy Model of Superposition if you want to see why, and the attention patterns within attention heads, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, attention patterns are intrinsically meaningful because they're just saying, how is the model moving information between positions? And positions are meaningful. Um, and the kind of core goal of our framework for understanding a transformer is saying, can we break down the model into a series of paths where the paths are between bits that are intrinsically interpretable and ideally have a privileged basis? Uh, so tokens, attention patterns, MLP activations, and output logits. And just try to interpret each of these and then look at the linear things connecting interpretable bits and try to understand those. Um, one thing to say is uh, I do think that the idea of privileged basis can be a bit overblown and should be thought of a bit more as a spectrum of how privileged a basis is than a binary. Um, one th there have been some interesting results since this paper came out that actually some directions in the residual stream are meaningful. In particular, this super interesting work from Tim Detmers, where they found that there are just some directions in the Transformers residual stream that are way bigger than others. And uh, I had fun a while ago uh, poking around at this and found that actually the model has kind of got a privileged basis in the residual stream, because of flitting points, where if you've got two numbers, one of which is much bigger than another, and you want to represent them in flitting points, it turns out it's much higher precision to represent them with separate directions rather than as x plus y and x minus y, because the bit of the float that tells you how big it is is going to be dominated by the big one, and this means the small one doesn't have many bits left for precision. Um, this is totally a tangent, so don't worry if you didn't follow that, but yeah, residual stream basis is like a little bit privileged sometimes. The token basis is very privileged, logic basis very privileged, attention pattern very privileged, MLP activation is kind of privileged. Uh, it's a bit of a leaky abstraction. Um, if you're interested, I have a Twitter thread where I go into a bunch more detail on how flitting points interacts with the residual stream not having a privileged basis. Um, there's also weird shit like Adam actually privileges the basis of anything it encounters because Adam sucks, but that's ah, a tangent. Um, so back to the residual stream. Um, there are a few other things worth saying about the residual stream. Um, 
which I know there's a lot of things to say. Residual streams are a really big deal, man. They're like the central object of a transformer. Um, so what is this idea of virtual weights? Um, I don't really like how this is explained here, so I'm going to give my own pitch. So you can think of parts of the model as um, each layer or each component of a layer is reading information in from the residual stream and writing it out um, by projecting it back to the residual stream. Um, one thing to emphasize is I don't actually like the words reading and writing here because I think they can be pretty misleading. But in particular, reading and writing intuitively feel like inverses or complementary operations, but they're actually very different. So uh, I prefer the word um, project for read and embed for write. So reading or projecting means taking this big thing over the residual stream and projecting it to a smaller thing, like the internal dimension of a head. And because we're going from big to small, most directions in the residual stream are just going to get thrown away. Um, the model is kind of... Um, no, sorry, let me rephrase that. The model is choosing to focus on a few meaningful directions, but a randomly chosen vector in space will always have non-zero dot product with these directions. So everything in the residual stream, unless it's literally orthogonal, will have some input to this head. But by aligning um, the thing they read in with the information they care about, the head can make sure it mostly gets the information it cares about. But it's like able to access everything in there. Writing, on the other hand, is going from small to big. And so we're basically choosing a set of directions in the residual stream and writing our information to those. And this is important because by choosing some directions, future things in the model can read, can like choose to look at those to read in information. Um, and uh, one cool consequence, which is this idea we're trying to explain with the notion of virtual weights, is this idea that, um, I'm just gonna zoom in just in case my text has been too small this entire time. Sure hope not, but may as well. Um, this idea of virtual weights, uh, I think this is kind of badly explained here, but whatever, is that if some bit of the model writes, another bit of the model reads stuff in, we can kind of look at the bit of the model that's reading stuff in, and then say, actually, the residual stream is the sum of all previous outputs of every bit of the model. And so the thing we're reading in is the sum of the, like, read-in portion of the output of every previous bit of the model. And uh, you can... Um, and you can multiply these together, but you can multiply the kind of writing pro embedding and the reading projection to get a, like, what is the effective combination of these two things? Um, this is kind of confusing because exactly what you mean by input and output depends a lot on what you're looking at. And actually, there are sometimes paths through the model that are basically, like through a layer that are basically linear, like through the value output circuit of a head. And I mostly wouldn't stress about exactly what this notation means, but just try to get your head around the general point of like, when a bit of the model reads something in, it's getting access to all of the information, but it can choose to focus on just the information at once. Um, and earlier components could have chosen to write to the bits that the relevant bit of the model would later read in, and by multiplying together the reading and writing weights, you can kind of get some crude proxy for like what's going on. And we kind of call them virtual weights, so we don't really flesh out the idea that much here. Um, so, yeah, this is another really cute idea. So, the idea here is, so, revisiting the idea before, that the residual stream is kind of how bits of the model communicate as they compose with each other. Um, 
it is... This is kind of a weird idea on some level. Because Transformers are really big. And the residual stream is big, but it's not that big. Like, in GPT-2 Small, uh, the residual stream shared across all layers is width 768. Um, but... Yeah, width 768. But each MLP layer is width four times that. So, uh, like, about 3,000. Um, side note. Basically, every Transformer I've come across, they just hard-code the number of MLP neurons as four times the residual stream width. I don't know why, but everyone does it. So you just memorize the number four. End tangent. So, yeah. Um, it's kind of weird. Like, 3,000 is a big number. 768 is a small number. Uh, there are... 12 MLP layers, and they're all sharing the same residual stream. What the fuck? And, um, yeah, so as it says here, yada yada yada, um, and, yeah, so what we think is going on is that the model is compressing more than 768 dimensions into the 768 dimensional residual stream. And we call this superposition, and it's fleshed out way more in uh, the paper, A Toy Model of Superposition, which you should go read because it's a great paper. Um, but very roughly, the idea of superposition is, let's say I've got uh, 10,000 vectors I want to compress into 1,000 dimensional space. It is impossible to do this with an with a linearly independent set, or let alone an orthogonal set, uh, I can only fit in a thousand. But if I'm willing to accept that my vectors can have dot product that is like small but not zero, I can actually compress way more vectors in there. And there are a bunch of random matsy results about like optimal ways of doing this, and how you can do exponentially many vectors in n dimensions with a really shit constant on the exponential. Um, though, personally, um, sorry, yes, you can compress many vectors into this bottleneck. Um, we actually call them bottleneck activations. And, um, yeah. Uh, two useful mental models to have when thinking about superposition is the two things that make it much easier for the model to... Uh, let me think about how to phrase this properly, because superposition is complicated. So, naively, compressing 10,000 vectors into 1,000 dimensional space seems kind of fucked, because even if we can get things in, such that any pair of vectors has at most dot product, say, 0.1, um, the way you read out any information from this compressed thing is you project onto some direction. If they're orthogonal, this is really nice, because every feature has a direction, and you can read out a feature by projecting onto that feature direction. But if they're not orthogonal, then there's interference. And if you've got a thousand, 10,000 features, each of which has non-trivial dot product with the feature you care about, then trying to dot product with that feature is going to be completely fucked because there's tons of interference. Um, but there are two ways that the model, depart, model in practice departs from this naive picture. Uh, the first is sparsity. Um, most features a model cares about are not actually going to be... Sorry. Most features a model cares about are sparse. Most of them are not there in any given input. Uh, for example, um, the input, I don't know, um, firework in a text is sparse. It is not there in most text. texts. The input Barack Obama is sparse. It is not there in most texts. 
the feature Azerbaijan, the spots. And this means that rather than thinking about we've got 10,000 vectors in there, we dot with one, uh, what happens? What's actually going on is that we've got uh, 10,000 vectors of which maybe a hundred randomly chosen are going to be there, and then we project onto one. And this is a much, much easier problem with way less interference. Um, so that's point one, sparsity. The second point is correlation. So um, some features are going to be correlated. Some features are going to be anti-correlated. If I know that I've got the feature um, this line of text corresponds to a Python list variable, it is much less likely that I'm going to have the feature um, there is an edgy vampire in a teenage romance novel. Um, thus, we could have two features which are actually pretty close to each other, representing these two things, but only one is going to be there any given time, so who cares about the interference? Um, so yeah, to cut a long story short, models can get quite a lot of mileage out of superposition. And um, things that make it much easier to do superposition are that are only having linear operations. Uh, because if you've only got linear things which add into a vector space or read out from it, um, you can just like compress things and solely think about interference in terms of the dot, dot products rather than applying weird other nonlinearities. Like if you've got 10,000 vectors in thousand dimensional space and you apply a ReLU to every dimension, I don't know how to reason about this, but it's kind of weird, and you're going to get a bunch more interference. But the residual stream is purely linear, so it's just a much, much nicer and better place to do superposition. And the other useful gear to have in your head about superposition is that the model is ultimately making a trade-off between I want to represent more features, and I want to cleanly read out the features without noise and interference. And there's going to be an optimal trade-off between these two, but it's probably not that the optimal trade-off is uh, zero interference represent only as many features as dimensions. Um, and so, yep, totally makes sense. The residual stream has superposition. Um, end long ramble about superposition. And one important consequence of this is that uh, the residual stream is like really hard to interpret again. I'm kind of emphasizing this because it's a really important point, and trying to interpret the residual stream is often the naive thing people try when they're first trying to interpret a transformer, and it's really hard. I do not recommend. And by decomposing the model into pods, we try to get traction on this. Um, another really cute thing is that the residual stream is kind of the model's memory. Uh, the residual stream contains... Um, all of the outputs of every layer, including all of the encoded messages that are being sent between layers, and um, this means that you're probably going to get some messages that are sent between, say, layer 1 and layer 3, which are totally useless for all future layers, but it's going to stick around. And the model does not have an automated way of clearing this out, but a weird, weird fact about neural networks is that, in practice, if there's a thing that would be convenient to them to do that we haven't done by default, they will just figure out how to do it on their own. And uh, we, we've seen some hints that the models have just learned to devote some parameters to, like, automatically clear up some information, where here clearing up information means saying, if there is information in this direction, output something which is in that direction but negative to like zero it out and yeah one test for this is you can look at an mlp neuron look at the dot product of its input and output weight and say oh that's close to negative one so it's deleting information um this isn't at all the focus of the paper but it's very cute and i think getting your head around like why you might want memory management and what's going on is pretty important Another 
uh, another thought on the residual stream is that, um, kind of naively, you might look at this structure of the model and say, okay, there's an embedding, this is the kind of where we represent the inputs, and, you know, there's 50,000 uh, input tokens. Surely we want to use all of the thousand dimensions of the residual stream. Uh, and then there's an unembed. Surely we want to represent... Uh, surely we want the entire residual stream by this point to just be things to be unembedded, because there's 50,000 output tokens. Um, but there's also a lot of shit that goes on inside the model with, like, information being moved between layers and composing, and only some of what layers read in want to come from the embedding, only some of what layers put out want to go to the unembedding versus other layers, and even by the end, even after some cleanup, the residual stream is still going to be a sum of a bunch of shit, and um, this means that in practice, I speculate the embedding and unembedding are only kind of picking some fraction of the residual stream to read from. Though, you can't cleanly divide this into layers, again, because everything's in superposition and it's a nightmare. Um, but yes. Cool. Uh, and l at long last, my long ramble on the residual stream. Um, I should say that I'm going to take way less time for the rest of this paper, but I think the start on a bunch on conceptual what the hell is going on is just actually pretty important. So, now I want to talk about attention heads. So, conceptually, what is an attention head? Um, so, an attention head is a bit of the model which has two key components. The first key component is an um, attention pattern. Um, so the attention pattern um, is that for, let's see, so let's just draw a concrete example. I've got some sequence, like, um, I don't know, A, B, C, and each of these is a separate position in the sequence. Um, I, oh god, can I not have persistent text? That's horrifying. Um, yes. So, okay, I'll just pontificate. We've got uh, three positions in our sequence, A, B, and C. A head is going to, for each of the three positions, learn a probability distribution over that position and previous positions. This is called the attention pattern. And then the head outputs a kind of weighted sum of some information it's chosen from the residual from previous residual streams, weighted by the attention probability on that position. It's going to add these all up, and then that's going to be the output of this head on the current token. And so the attention pattern, uh, the attention pattern matrix is going to be a lower triangular matrix where each row adds up to one. And um, often you see things in terms of attention layers, uh, but it turns out that it is just mathematically true that um, the attention layer is just made up of the sum of the output of a bunch of attention heads in parallel. Uh, it's often written as uh, you concatenate together the outputs of each head, and then you um, multiply by some massive output matrix. Uh, but this is mathematically equivalent to splitting the output matrix into a bunch of smaller blocks per head, and then multiplying the like result of that head by the output and taking a linear combination. Um, this is one of the uh, it's mathematically equivalent uh, points earlier. I recommend not caring about this and just saying the output of an attention layer is the sum of a bunch of independent attention heads. Each head operates basically independently of the others, and their output just adds together. Um, and this is just, in my opinion, obviously the correct way to reason about a transformer, and the concatenate and multiply thing is totally fucked. Um, 
Cool. Now we have attention heads as information fields. So it's easiest to think of this as what happens if the attention pattern of a head is just sparse. It's just one on some token, zero on all other tokens. And yeah, fundamentally the point of an attention head is to move information because the attention layers are the only bit of a transformer that can move information between positions. And the point of the attention, yeah, and so the attention pattern tells the head which positions to look at, and when the head looks at a position, it calculates a value vector. This is just a linear map from the residual stream to some small space d head. In practice, the space tends to be, to be 64 dimensional. Um, we call that number d head, the internal head dimension. We then take the value vector for every previous position. Um, I often call these, these, we call these source positions. We then take the weighted average by the attention, prob by the attention weights on each previous position to get this thing we call the result vector. Um, and then we multiply that kind of average result vector by this output matrix to get a um, thing living in residual stream space that we can just add back in. Um, and the we're now going to do some algebra. So what's going on here is that so fundamentally. Each of these is a matrix multiply. Um, we start with some model. Um, yeah, we start with some tensor uh, X, which is um, position by, yeah, X is like position by D model we then multiply on the... Ah, is that not a way to make this persistent? Okay, I'm back. So it turns out that Loom just does not want you to be able to do this kind of thing. So instead I'm going to use a Google Jamboard. So yeah, um, we what we've got is we start with some vector x. Um, x has shape uh, position by d model, and x is like the residual stream. We then multiply by this value vector of weights, uh, this tensor of weights. Um, we're going to transpose it because normally we do the matrix multiplications on the left and this has shape model by head and yeah model is big head is small um, we then multiply by the output which maps from small to big so this looks like head times m and on the left, we multiply by the attention, which goes from kind of P source um, to P destination. Um, note that P source and P destination have the same length, but I think it's useful to distinguish the start and end things. And remember, a head outputs things on the destination token by reading in things from all source tokens. And X is PS. And a useful fact about matrix multiplication is that it's associative. The order we do things in doesn't matter. And so the default order is like, um, you do X times value, you do that times attention, and you do attention times the WO, but everything is equivalent. And uh, in practice, I think it is easiest to think of the operation of multiply by this matrix, 
and the operation multiplied by this matrix as separate. Um, one thing to emphasize when you start staring at transformer algebra is it's really helpful to keep in your head the distinction between um, parameters, which are weights stored in the model that are learned by the model um, during training and updated by the optimizer, and just kind of like a fixed part of its functional form. And then the um, activations. Activations are things that are purely calculated on a particular input are a function of that input and will vanish when you stop running the model on that input and run on some other inputs. And it's worth having a clear conceptual distinction in your head about what is a parameter and what is um, an activation. And here, x is an activation, attention pattern is an activation. Um, this is the rare instance where we do a matrix multiplication of an activation and an activation. Um, this is weird and not a thing that is normally done in models. And these are parameters. And there is quite a lot of depth to this diagram, uh, to this equation. And I think it's worth just taking a moment to like stare at it and really get your head around what's going on. Um, and so the key thing in my eyes is that, um, yes, if you didn't follow, I recommend just like actually pausing this and just like taking a moment and just actually trying to trace the algebra yourself and figure out what's going on. And so the key thing in my eyes is that this thing on the right is just a big matrix. We call this W O V. Um, and, like, the thing in the middle, the values, just never mattered. The only thing that mattered is this big matrix product. Um, and this is important because it tells us that trying to ever interpret value vectors is probably fucked because the only thing that determines the output of a head is the product of these two matrices. I could totally imagine, say, doubling this matrix and halving this matrix, but the product is the same. Or I rotate this matrix, and then rotate this matrix the other way, and that product is the same. So values are kind of meaningless. They're just an intermediate state in a low-rank factorization of a big model-by-model -model matrix. Um, but yeah, a uh, useful picture to have in your head. This thing is big by big, this thing is big by small, this thing is small by big. Low rank factorization means there's a skinny bottleneck in the middle. Um, the second important takeaway is that the OV part is separate and independent of the attention part. I can apply them in any order, and they kind of don't touch each other. They act on different sides of X. And this is a pretty deep point about how attention heads work. It's like, what's going on there? Um, the way I would phrase what's going on there is that... So the way I would phrase what's going on there is that there are two calculations being done by an attention head. Where should I copy information... Where should I get information from? This is done by the attention, which moves you between positions. And then, what do I do when I found the positions to move information from? What information do I move to my current position? That is determined by uh, W O V. Um, and these are just kind of independent things. Um, and uh, we often refer, and it's worth just like disentangling in your head that these are like two related but basically independently varying f operations of a head. And if you're trying to understand a head, you should try to break these down into their separate things and understand the attention and understand WOV. And also, focus on WOV, not WO or WV on their own. Um, we often refer to the WOV part as the OV circuit, 
um, when you figured out where to look. Figure out what you should do when you get there. Um, it's now worth talking about A, and like, what's up with A? So, um, yes. Uh, oh yeah, um, A, a uh, thing that we do a bunch in this paper is using tensor products. I mostly think this is a mistake, and we should not have put this in the paper. Uh, but that is just me. So, uh, if you find this confusing, I recommend not thinking about it. Uh, but roughly what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to say, okay, mechanistic interpretability is about engaging with the functional form of the network. This means treating the network as a mathematical function, rather than as a black box that takes in inputs and gives outputs. Which means we need a way to represent the function that is the network. And this is really easy with a linear function, because the matrix M is both the, like, a representation of the linear model M, and it's also just a function, because uh, Mx is the output of the linear map that takes x as an input and gives mx as an output. Uh, so this just isn't an issue if you're looking at linear things. Sadly, transforms are not linear, which means we can't do this. In particular, we've got a function that multiplies things on both sides. We multiply x by w of v on the right and by a on the left. And um, we represent this function with this tensor product, which means put x in the middle, multiply by a on the left, and multiply by w of v on the right. Um, this is basically just another way of saying it is the function mapping x to this thing. I personally like lambda notation, where you could write the tensor product instead as like lambda x um, maps to this, uh, but yeah, whatever. Uh, ignore the tensor product stuff, I'm not going to think about it too hard. Um, so now, what is up with it? How is attention calculated? Um, so the sound way of doing attention, you take a linear map, WK, uh, which takes the residual stream, big, maps it to D head, small, and gives us keys. Keys are kind of the things attached to the source positions telling us where we might want to look. Um, then we've got queries. Uh, again, we do a map on the residual stream, uh, which takes big and maps it to small. Um, and then we take the dot product, uh, which here we're writing as Q transpose K, because actually we're thinking of Q and K as position by D head tensors. And by taking the transpose and the product, this is a nice notational way of writing the position by position matrix of um, like dot products, and then we do a softmax over it, which actually elides a bunch of detail. What we're actually doing is we're taking our, um, we're taking every pair of positions and creating a dot product to get a big cell. Um, we're then taking the lower triangular bit of the cell because bits can only attend backwards, and then we're taking every bit of the triangle um, where this side is source, yeah, this side is source, and this side is destination, and what we're doing, no, other way around. I'm gonna go back to my whiteboard because loom is annoying. So, yeah. We take the um, dot products of um, queries and keys. Um, yeah, I think keys are down here, which is also source. Um, where this size is like a position. We then take the dot products of um, queries, which are destination. is also a pos dimensional thing. And we take the dot product of all pairs of queries and keys across positions. But 
this model is auto regressive, it can only look backwards and like generate things forwards. So we then take the lower triangular bit and we just set everything up here to minus infinity. Uh, you could also think of it as zero, but we were about to put it into a softmax, so minus infinity is easier. Then for each destination, we want the rows to add up to one. So we do a softmax across each row. And so we do this kind of mask then softmax operation. And because mapping residual stream to keys, mapping residual stream to queries, and dot producting queries and keys are all purely linear, we can actually refer to that with this glorious string of algebra. Um, X transpose, WQ transpose, WK, X. Um, and uh, again, this is just a... Uh, this whole thing is a uh, residual stream by residual stream matrix. It takes as input two residual stream vectors and gives us output a position by position matrix of scores. We can do a softmax over it and we get a we get a bunch of probability distributions, the attention pattern. And importantly, the only thing that matters is this matrix, WQK. WK and WQ only matter in that they help us define this matrix. Um, queries and keys are totally arbitrary, because if you can mess with WK um, and then mess with WQ in a way such that their product is the same, the keys and queries are totally different, but the attention pattern is the same. And so again, the way to think about the attention bit of a head is as being determined by this uh, low rank factorization of a residual stream by residual stream matrix, uh, WQK. Uh, one thing to note is that while WQK and WOV have the same dimensions, they are kind of doing fundamentally different things. WQK is a bilinear form. It takes two vectors the residual stream as input and outputs a scalar. Um, WOV is a linear map or endomorphism. It takes as input a residual stream vector and it outputs another residual stream vector. Um, these are just very different functions that both happen to be represented as residual stream by residual stream matrix. And this is useful to notice. Um, I think all of these are things I basically covered. Um, attention heads move information between residual streams. Um, yep. Yep. Yeah, this is a pretty important point. Um, model, the residual stream of a model will contain lots of will contain lots of information that is copied from other tokens and is not directly about the present token. This is a very important caveat to naive interpretability efforts that just look at the attention patterns of a model and say, oh, it's looking at the dog token, so it's clearly copying information about dog. Um, what actually often happens, especially in deeper models, is the model collects information from earlier tokens, collects it all on some token, and then later copies it on forwards. And, um, on this, and the fact that it attends to this token does not mean that it's getting information from there. Um, from like, sorry, that got confused. Let's start this again. Let's say I've got a sentence like, uh, the cat sat on the mat, full stop. The rat sat on the, mm. um, a thing the model might want to do is it might want to compress the information about the sentence, the cat sat on the mat to just a single vector, which has information like probably a kid's story about animals, about mats, rhyming. Um, and it might want to use this in the next sentence. But it'd be kind of wasteful if it had to attend to, like, every token in the previous sentence to get the relevant info. So a thing it might do is on, say, the full stop at the end of the cat sat on the mat sentence, it copies all of the information and then stores it there. Uh, and then in future, when it wants information about a previous sentence, it can just attend to the full stop. And if this happens, uh, it's because the residual stream on the full stop token contains lots of copied information. So the fact that the model later looked at the full stop does not mean it really cared about the fact there was a full stop. It meant there was moving information that was then stored on the full stop token. Um, attention patterns represent information movement, but they kind of only represent information movement as a function of all previous computation in the model. 
not just as a function of like what exactly is the token we're looking at. Um, point two, attention and WOV basically act independently and can kind of be happen in any order, be thought of independently. A tells you which where information is moved from and to. Uh, WOV tells you what information you read in and how to write it. Um, yep, I'm going to skip that. Um, yeah, this is a key point. So the out. So the attention pattern is nonlinear, but the attention pattern is not directly output by the head. The thing that is output is this term, a x w o v. The attention pattern is just like a re-weighting that shuffles around bits of x. And even though the attention pattern is a nonlinear function of x, if you kind of stick your hands over your ears and ignore that part, this is just a purely linear function of x. We're mixing information on this side, we're mixing information on that side. Um, but just it's purely linear, and this is kind of wild, because it means that if we ignore, if we just pretend that attention is just fixed, then an attention head is just an entirely linear function, and an attention only transformer is just an entirely linear function from the inputs to the logits. This is fucking wild. Um, it is not actually the case that the attention is fixed, obviously, but because they're kind of semi-independent, this is often a useful lens to have. Um, one useful intuition this motivates is, why do transformers have MLPs at all? Attention is nonlinear, it's got a softmax, why isn't that sufficient? And the answer is that attention is kind of almost linear. It can rewire how information is moved between positions. It can do quite intelligent computation about how information is moved, but it's yeah, it can do intelligent computation about how information is moved, but fundamentally it's not doing something super interesting or super dramatic. Um, it's just it, it can't do like deep computation on the information in the model. It's purely capable of moving things around. Um, this is not technically true, because I think an attention only transformer is Turing complete via a bunch of stupid hacks, but like, whatever, let's ignore that for now. Um, yeah, um, and yep, uh, the only thing that matters is the QK circuit, because WQ and WK all operate together. Uh, I'm, yeah, jargon, I'm going to use, um, QK circuit to refer to this matrix WQ, which is a product of WQ transpose WK, um, and is the kind of how do we calculate attention bit? And we're going to use OV circuit to refer to WOV, which is the product of WO and WV, which is the what information do we copy when we figured out where in the residual stream to look? Um, one note is that even though I'm saying the word copy here, um, the WOV, the OV circuit, can be doing fairly meaningful computation because, like, it is a linear map. Linear maps can do useful things. For example, if I've got a token here and I'm looking at a copy of the same token earlier and I want to move the information over but also say, and also this is a different token, this is like a earlier copy of the current token. Um, I can just have the OV matrix kind of rotate this into a different subspace, and this just kind of works. Um, yeah, this is cute. Uh, so attention heads are kind of linear. Um, if you ignore the computation of the attention pattern, it's just multiply on one side by a matrix, multiply on the other side by a matrix. If you again ignore the attention, the attention bit and look at the composition, then you just see the same thing again. Um, and you get, like, I don't know, tensor product notation, but what it basically means is you stick x in the middle, you're multiplying on this side by uh, attention of head 1, attention of head 2, you multiply on this side by ov of head 1, ov of head 2, uh, 
tensor product means this is put in the wrong order, whatever. Um, this only really makes sense if you're ignoring how the attention patterns are computed, but within the framing of we want to decompose the network into a bunch of paths, um, and then look at paths between interpretable bits and like understand them, uh, this is actually a pretty deep and important point that makes the we can ignore attention thing a lot more reasonable. Because what's going on is that, um, how the fuck is this? Um, there are kind of, one picture I'd like to have in my head is thinking of an attention head as being like a circuit element with one output, O, and three inputs, um, Q, K, and V. And so what's going on is the Q and K get merged into this attention thing. And attention is both kind of intrinsically interpretable because it's just about positions, and positions make sense. Um, and in some sense, the Q and K bits just kind of terminate here. Um, but then they somewhat influence the output, which happens via the V, and there's like this element-wise multiplication between the attention pattern and the value bit. So like the attention kind of matters going forwards, but like in some sense, this bit is an interesting non-linear interaction that ends here, and both Q and K make come from like interesting paths through the model, uh, and then there can be other paths that go via the OV circuit mediated by the attention pattern. But this means that when we're looking at paths through the model, we don't need to stop and interpret any bits within the attention head if we're going via the V bit. Um, we can just say take a path fully from the input tokens via an OV circuit to the output tokens and just like interpret the input part and the output part without stressing too much about exactly what this means. This is like not a perfectly clean and elegant phrasing because the attention bit does matter, but the fact that they're de disentangleable is really deep and important. Um, I think it's probably also just worth taking a bit to reflect on like why does attention work? Why is this a reasonable thing to have on your model? And like, how can models use it? So I find it instructive to think about attention in the context of um, convolutional networks, especially 1D convolutional networks. So a 1D convolutional network would be like, you've got a sequence um, and then we want to kind of for each point in the sequence, um, take in some information from previously, and what we do is just use take a linear map over, say, the previous three elements. So like here, we get information to this bit with a linear map over the previous three things. We get information to this bit via a linear map over those. We get information to this via information to those, etc. And this is like kind of reasonable. We need some way to constrain uh, how information, how much information each bit gets access to, because ultimately our model can't, wants to be able to take in sequences of varying length, and we don't want it to have stupid amounts of parameters. And this is baking into the model this intuition that like nearby things matter. The fact that terms in the sequence are close by to you means they are more likely to be relevant. And my like high level intuition about neural networks is uh, if they are sufficiently big, uh, they are smart enough to figure out on their own what is sensible and need less handholding. And the handholding of local things good is sorry. And the handholding of local things good is useful, but also kind of limiting because, for example. Um, Let's say I'm predicting the next token in an academic paper. Uh, there's the title, there's the abstract, and there's like a bunch of text. And then there's a method section. If I want to predict what's going to go in the method section, 
being able to read the abstract and the title is pretty damn useful. Uh, but it's pretty hard to track these long-range dependencies. And, yeah. I don't really know what the right... Um, yeah, it's hard to track these long-range dependencies. And... Uh, with Transformers, the solution is, rather than telling it, you can look uniformly at the previous three tokens, but it's really, really hard to look back. We tell it, we think you're grown up enough that you can figure out where it's useful to look. And we're going to give you some fraction of your parameters. I think it's like, uh, how much goes to attention? Something like uh, one sixth of the parameters of the transformer go to attention. And we're like, you can use these parameters to figure out where you should be moving information from. What does an intelligent wiring and an intelligent convolution look like? And as we'll see later with injection heads, there can actually be like a pretty sophisticated and intelligent amount of computation that goes into what this smart dynamic convolution looks like. But yeah, fundamentally, attention is a generalized convolution where we allow transformers to compute how they ought to be moving information around for themselves. Cool. Um... Let me just check whether there's anything remaining in the conceptual takeaways that I don't think I've covered. Um, yes. Uh, transformers are ridiculously linear. I've said this a bunch of times. I will continue saying this. It's really, really important. Uh, the entire notion of decomposing a model down into pods is just like one of the fundamental things we want people to take away from this paper. And this only works because things are linear. Both heads are surprisingly linear via the OB circuit. The residual stream is literally linear. Um, and this means that you can just break lots of things down into bits that came from different parts of the network. And then try to understand these. And this is really important. Um, and this parts framework is like really powerful and attention only models because they are so linear because the only way to get from the input tokens to the output tokens is going via the residual stream and via ov bits of heads these are all basically linear and this means that rather than thinking about pods from say the inputs to mlp neurons we can think about the output logics as being a sum over all pods via like every like every possible combination of like heads and residual streams in different ways and each of these on its own is like reasonably interpretable because it is a linear map from the input tokens to the output logics um and yep um and then there's the separate pods that we need to understand which take which are the attention things, uh, the attention pattern calculation. And this is kind of funky, because there are two inputs. Uh, we have the like Q input and the K input. Both of these are coming through the embedding. And importantly, this kind of terminates there. So even though we understand the attention pattern, this isn't then an input into future things. And yeah. Um, yep, all of this other stuff I basically covered. Attention heads are independent and additive. They read from the residual stream and add to it. Um, attention heads can be split into like the fairly independent computations of community attention pattern via the QK circuit and figuring out what to do when you've looked there via the OV circuit. Um, Keys, queries, and values are not fundamentally interpretable. They're intermediate results when computing low rank matrices, and it's often useful to not think about them. One thing I didn't really talk about, but I'll get to later, is composition. Composition's really important. Um, and one weird thing is that because attention heads have like three inputs and one output, there's actually three ways for an attention head to compose with earlier things via the qubit via the k-bit and via the v-bit, which we call qk and v-compositions, which are terms I really like because I came up with them. 
and brings me joy. Um, and yes. Cool. So now to actually go through the paper. Um, hopefully now I've laid enough groundwork, this should be a lot more chill. So, zero layer transformer. Uh, this is the really dumb transformer that has an embedding and then an unembedding. Um, yeah, that's a fun that's a fun model. Um, and so the main thing that I want to illustrate here is the idea of an end to end path. So, the model. Um, you got the input tokens, you linear map, you do a linear map, and you get the output tokens, uh, the output logics. And there are just a single end-to-end -end path from the inputs to the outputs, and everything along that path is linear. And the path is heavily constrained because there are no attention layers. At the point of attention is moving information between positions, it is not there, and as a result, um, we are just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Um, it can't use earlier tokens to predict the next token, it can only use the current token. This means the optimal behavior is approximating the bigram log likelihood. Uh, just like... Um, mm -hmm. um, the optimal map from the current token to probably the next token is just... You go through a bunch of text, you calculate a frequency table, and you like look this up, and turns out that models basically do this. Um, and yeah, the like key mental moves here are one, everything was linear, so we can just look at the end-to-end -end thing rather than trying to interpret the residual stream in the middle. Two, we analyzed what things were easy to represent. Um, maps from the current token to the next token versus things that were hard to represent maps from previous tokens to the next token, which is literally impossible. And we reasoned about what a like, sensible, optimal thing to do would be given those constraints and given that path. And like those are the key mental motions we're going to be going through in future. And yeah. Um, we say this thing that WUWE will be relevant in future because it appears in every transformer. I think this is like kind of true, but we overrate this a bit. Um, so, yeah. Like, the term WUWE is going to be vaguely bigram-ish, because it can only affect things from the current token mapping to the next token, but also lots of other bits of the model are doing things that are also kind of bigram-y, and it probably partially wants to use the WUWE term to, like, fudge that to be better at bigrams. But also, there's lots of other things that the embedding and unbedding are trying to do, and yeah. Um, one other useful takeaway from this section is that WE and WU are doing fundamentally different things. Uh, like, the set of bigrams is not symmetric. Uh, Obama will follow Barrack. Uh, Barrack will not follow Obama. Um, and... This is an important point, because naively people are often like, ah, the output space is the same as the input space, so obviously the unembedding is the same as the embedding, or they're like the inverse, and even the name unembedding is super misleading. They're just completely different operations. This is also important because a thing that people often do in practice is use the same matrix for the embedding and for the unembedding, and this is just wildly unprincipled and really annoys me and makes it way harder to interpret the embedding and the unembedding, so please don't do this. Um, but, yes. They are doing different things. If you force them to be the same, the model will learn creative ways to get around what you're trying to do, like using MLP layers to kind of be an effective embed or unembed thing, and it's like, yeah, Just separate them. Okay, now on to one layer attention only transformers. So, yeah, high level things. Uh, one layer attention only models are an ensemble. They're an ensemble meaning like a sum of a bunch of different functions. 
because we can decompose the model into a bunch of parts, and we can understand each part semi-independently and reason about how they sum to the output. Um, two, the um, key functional form that is non-trivial, that it's able to represent, is in addition to the bigrams, we have these skip trigrams, which are where you've got um, a gap, like you've got a destination token B, you want to predict the token C that comes next, and you say if A is anywhere in the context, uh, I'm going to predict that C is more likely C is more likely to be the correct next token. And yes, so um, yes, so this is all a bunch of fancy algebra, which basically says um, each head is the mathematical operation x maps to attention x w o v. The uh, output, the residual stream x1 is the input residual stream, the embeddings, plus the sum of the output of every head, which is the sum of a x w o v for that head, where each head had its own a and w o v, and um, we then multiply everything by the unembedding to get the output. Um, and we can substitute in x0 equals w e t here, and then if we expand this, we get this enormous sum um, that looks like... Um, kind of looks like this, but I hate the tensor product notation. So what's actually going on is we've got w u w e uh, w u w e x transpose, and then we've got um, a w like yeah. Then we've got uh, attention times x, and there's this thing with a transpose on it. Um, and what's going on is that the, yeah, so what's going on is that the output is just like this almost linear sum of functions of the input, with the only interesting bit being the attention limit. And because the output logits are a sum, we can mostly reason about each term of the sum independently. Um, this is not entirely true because um, ultimately the logits are being input into a log submax to get the log probs for the loss, and log submax is not a linear function, and you could totally imagine things where like, this term in the sum only makes sense in the context of the other term, like, there are two plausible answers and this bit's, this term is trying to suppress one of the plausible answers, because it thinks another bit might predict it, for example. Um, but as a first attempt, it is pretty useful to just look at each end-to-end -end path term independently. Um, another thing to emphasize is that um, we've gone from having an OV circuit within a head, WOV, um, to having, which was from the residual stream to the residual stream, to having a, like, full OV circuit. Uh, WU, WOV, WE, which maps from the um, really big input tokens, uh, so like, super super big, to the uh, large-ish residual stream, maps from the residual stream to itself, and then maps from the residual stream to, like, the massive output vocab. And so the cumulative product of these is, like, sorry, the product of these is, like, a vocab by vocab matrix, which factors through the tiny bottleneck of the head, um, but where we've now kind of fully faithfully represented what should we do if we attend to a token in terms of this, like, massive vocab by vocab matrix? And this is a massive pain, but it's also, uh, well, it's a massive pain because it's like a 50,000 by 50,000 tensor. Uh, even just representing it in memory can take like 
a gigabyte of RAM. Uh, if you're using Flight 32, if you've got 12 heads, this can take like 12 gigabytes. It's terrible. Um, but, oh no, my math is wrong. Um, a 50,000 by 50,000 matrix in Flight 32 takes up uh, 10 gigabytes. Um, and yeah, it's enormous, it's hard to read it, but it's also like conceptually really easy to reason about. It's just an enormous lookup table saying, if this token is there, it maps to this other token. Um, and this means that like each head can basically be thought of as like an enormous lookup table. Um, if it attends somewhere, then what do we do when we get there? Just consult my lookup table for different tokens. And the other part of understanding a head comes from this attention bit. And so, what's going on there? So, yeah, with the attention part, we can repeat the same trick where we replace x, the residual stream, with the embedding of tokens, and then multiply wkk on either side with the embedding matrix. So now we have a, um, now we've got something which maps, which takes in two copies of the input space, i.e. two pairs of tokens, and gives us a scalar, which is like the attention score for that pair of inputs. And uh, I call this the full QK circuit. Uh, in the paper, we called it just the QK circuit. So I guess we weren't calling WQK a QK circuit. I prefer my notation, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, and so this fully represents, for this head, if we look at some token, what output token will we boost and how much? It's just a lookup table. This is a lookup table saying for each pair of tokens, how much do we want to be attending to? And yep, this is a cute diagram that basically represents what I've been trying to explain. I recommend pausing and staring at it if you feel confused. And yes, one really important thing to Rock when looking at this diagram is that the only way the purple and uh, gold lines interact is that there's an element-wise multiplication here. We get the value vector from each source token, and then we mediate it by the attention weights given by the purple one. But that's the only thing that matters. And in particular, the only way the destination token can mediate what comes out of the source token is by... Yeah, the only way the destination token can mediate what comes out of the source token is by influencing which source tokens are attended to and how much we weight them, not by influencing the gold line, which is what do we do when we get them. This matters because it means that if there are multiple destinations that want to attend to the same source token, then they have to do exactly the same thing. The only thing they can moderate is how much to attend to it, not what to do when you get there. And this is just like a pretty deep and fundamental limitation to the functional form of attention. Uh, I'm just going to pause there for a moment because it's like actually a really important point to make sure you get your head around. Cool. So, yeah, freezing attention patterns. This is just giving better intuition for why thinking of them as independent can be helpful. Um, yes. Um, so, yep. Um, OV circuits. Um, ooh, this looks fun. Uh, do I even remember what's in this table? Um, yes. So here we've got a bunch of random discussion of things like We've got this enormous QK table, which is vocab by vocab, and this enormous OV table that's vocab by vocab. Um, how do we actually go about representing these? And there's like a bunch of weird questions in here. There's like, um, <clears throat> one of these tables is kind of destination by source, one of them is source by output. 
These are kind of related, but kind of not related. How do we combine them? Which is the point about pivoting. Uh, there's how do we normalize them? Like, how do we map them onto something that's meaningful by the lights of the network? Like, the logits are translation invariant. If you add one to everything, it's the same output, which means... Mm, um, the model just doesn't get that much latitude to choose exactly what happens there. Um, and then... Words. Um, yep, the model just doesn't get that much room to pick and choose... Words. Totally lost that train of thought. I'm going to skip that. Um, yeah, how do we normalize them? So the model just doesn't care about a, adding a constant to the logits, which means you can just subtract things off. So this is pretty chill. Um, while QK scores kind of for each destination token, it, there's like a separate kind of scale for how much the softmax, how much the softmax cares. Uh, anyway, there's a bunch of other technical details. But here's a fun table of things you can look at. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on the nice curated things in here. But you should totally go play around on that table. Or screw around with your own model. I will hopefully soon have an open source model uh, for playing around with small attention only things. And yeah, so uh, in context learning, uh, the main exciting thing about the section is this big table of skip trigrams. Um, it is worth just staring at it and being like, does it make sense that this is a reasonable thing to care about? Like, um, if you see the token R and you're trying to figure out what comes next, it's like plausibly an adjective. Knowing that someone used the adjective perfect before makes it more likely the adjective perfect comes next because it's like the person's style. Seems kind of reasonable. Um, words like super or absolute are kind of like positive coding, so it kind of makes sense they're more likely to come up in a uh, super context. This is a cute one. Uh, if we see one, we're trying to figure out what might come next, and we're like, um, ah, if we see one and we see two previously, this is evidence that we're counting. If we're counting, then the thing that's most likely to come next is two. And that kind of makes sense. Uh, if we see the word has, and we saw two in the past, then we're like, oh, we're doing numbers. So it's more likely that a number word comes next. Uh, I don't know. All of these are just kind of pretty dumb things. The way I think about skip trigrams is like, if the main hammer you have is being really fucking good at bigrams, what are dumb ways you can use the prior context to moderate and adjust what you output. One useful thing to bear in mind here, um, or, so zooming out, why do skip trigrams happen? Why is this the thing that is natural for these models to do? So firstly, um, I assert that it is basically just like a, um, near exact description of the functional form of the head, that the thing that it is doing is having a massive QK lookup table, a massive OV lookup table, and using these to map between things. This basically corresponds to a massive ensemble of skip trigrams. Um, the reason we have the skip part and the try part rather than something more is that fundamentally um, attention involves a destination token, a source token, and updating an output token. Uh, the only way the other tokens matter is that they inhibit the purple line, which tells us what to attend to. They either inhibit it or boost it depending on their attention scores. But this means that the head just fundamentally cannot do nonlinear interactions between different tokens unless it's doing really clever shit around uh, how the attention softmax. And this means you couldn't get something like a quadgram or pentagram or something. Um, 
deck you just kind of the best you can do is three. The reason we get skip is that um, it's actually pretty hard for attention to cope with positions. Uh, I'm not really going to get into how positional embeddings work right now because it's a massive rabbit hole and I don't like it. Basically, every approach for doing positional embeddings is kind of a massive hack, but uh, another thing is that from the perspective of the model, we give it access to positional information, but it is really bad at tracking interactions between the positional information and the token information. It can learn a pattern like, I am going to attend to the previous token, or the token two tokens back, or something. It can learn patterns like that. It can learn patterns like, I'm going to attend to any token whose value is perfect. But it really struggles to learn things like, I'm going to attend to the previous token if the value was perfect, otherwise I'm going to attend to myself. Because that's a non-linear interaction between token value and position and attention is really struggles with that kind of non-linear interaction between different features within a token or different or like different features across tokens and that's where you get the skip part if we're only looking at the information on a token when figuring out where to attend then the main thing we get is yeah if we're only looking at information on which tokens to attend to then um, the only thing we can get out is going to depend on that token value, not on the token position, and vice versa. It is possible that the head can use position and not use token value. For example, you tend to get summer heads, which attend to the previous token, um, though these cannot moderate what happens using the destination token which means you can't get like a proper trigram. What you can get is a map saying, if the source token is the token before the current one, then boost this in the output, otherwise don't. Uh, but you can't moderate that for what the source, for the, what the destination is. So it's kind of like a skip bigram in some sense. Like given that you have, I don't know, the word perfect here, what is most likely to come two tokens on? And that's kind of messy. Um, what I'm saying is not perfectly true because models can do clever shit. Like they uh, attend backwards and uh, like they attend to the previous token if the destination token fits into certain categories, but otherwise the query vector is different so it doesn't happen. And they can do like some things that are mildly more intelligent, but uh, what I said is good enough. And Um, yeah, one cute motif to care about is that lots of these examples are copying. Um, so lots of these things will be like, uh, if perfect is in the past, predict perfect. If large is in the past, predict large. If nibbers is in the past, predict nibbers. Uh, which is a random HTML escape sequence, apparently. I don't know how HTML works. Um, and this is like kind of initially surprising, but kind of makes sense on reflection. The way I think about it is um, relationships between tokens get kind of weird and subtle, and it's much harder to have like a sensible trigram of like, given that this thing was in the past and this thing is there at the moment, predict what's going to happen next, but it is just like pretty often the case that it is pretty often the case that tokens within a bit of text will be repeated, and it is also pretty often the case that you can kind of guess when something might be repeated based on the token before, like perfect is likely to be repeated after a word like is or looks or are, and thus copying is a good way to get like quite a lot of mileage out of the things, uh, out of the fact that tokens are repeated, but we can be more intelligent about it. And then there's weirder things like tokenization. It's horrifying. Um, in particular, 
Uh, the tokenization of a word that begins with a space is different from the tokenization of a word that does not begin with a space, such as at the start of a line. So, space Ralph is a single token. Ralph without a space is tokenized as R and Alf. And there are some skip trigrams about combining this. And I know a general theme you see in models is they don't like the tokenizer. There are lots of ways the tokenizer kind of sucks for the thing they care about. And they will devote some parameters, especially in early layers, to dealing with this and like fixing things and representing things more in an internal state they're happy with. Um, and yeah, here are some cute patterns. Um, in general, I think that, uh, yeah, here's a bunch of examples of like random cute things like Python code, which says, ah, if I'm defining a function and I've got an, if I've got an open bracket and I've got a function definition in the past, it's more likely I'm outputting self and random stuff like that. And I don't know, this is all very cute. Um, I mostly recommend engaging with the section on the level of understand why skip trigrams happen and then just skim through and get a flavor for like what are the kinds of things that models find it easy to represent. Um, another reason this is kind of useful, so if you're looking at a more complicated model and trying to reason about what it's doing, you can kind of take skip trigrams as a baseline. They're really easy for models to do. And so you might speculate that the model is just doing a bunch of, the model is doing about as much, getting as about as much juice as it can out of skip trigrams. This is a baseline thing, probably a bunch of heads are doing, and then it's trying to do more intelligent things on top of this. And keeping that in mind is useful, often useful to get a sense of what to focus on. Um, and yeah, yeah. One thing I find, yeah, one thing that is kind of interesting skimming through this is just like a lot of this clearly really wants to be a result about uh really wants to be a result about trigrams like um i don't know um yeah like say four mm, in like you really want to know whether four was like two tokens ago, or maybe three, depending on how long the variable was, um, to know where the range comes next. I can't do that, but I can't say a four is anywhere in the path. It's a bit more likely. You can also think of this as some a, like weak example of uh, kind of de-tokenization, where the token in, in English text, means something very different from the token in in Python code. And it's using the fact that 4 came in the past as, like, weak evidence, I'm currently in Python code, I should be doing something differently. And... Yep. Um, yeah, positional embeddings, kind of pain. Um, yes, I generally think about positional embeddings in terms of standard positional embedding, which basically means in addition to the token embeddings, which are a massive lookup table, we have massive lookup table mapping positions to the residual stream, and at the start we just add in the relevant lookup for the current position. And in this case, you can just think of WQK as having extra rows and columns for the positions, and sometimes you have heads that you can just kind of read off what they're doing. And... yeah. Uh, here are some cute things that are kind of a... Here are some cute things that are kind of a... What would you do if you had to do a, like, shitty skip for bigram? Um, like... Ah, I've got a token which... I, the token one ago was kun. I have no idea what the current token could possibly be, though it's probably apostrophe T. Uh, but given the token one ago was couldn't, I should predict a resist next. And this is basically a way of simulating, I really want to do a trigram. I can't, but I can use the fact that couldn't is such a strong bigram that the skip bigram of couldn't to resist is basically the trigram of couldn't resist.
and all right so yeah skip trigram bugs so these are interesting and i think it's worth actually trying to get your head around what's going on here so the key insight is an attention head has these two independent things it's got the uh where should i look the purple line and it's got the what should i do when i get there the gold line and the destination token cannot change what the gold line does uh, depending on what the destination token is. It can only mediate how much weight to give each gold line. And this leads to bugs. Because if there are multiple destination tokens that care about the same source token, but want to learn different skip trigrams, there is no way of representing this. Uh, for example, if you've got the skip trigram uh, with the destination token in, the source token keep, um, then you might want to do mind, because keep in mind is a phrase, probably wants to be a trigram, but whatever. If you've got the token at, this is a destination, keep as a source, you've got bay, because keep at bay is obviously a phrase, and it really wants to be a trigram, but can kind of approximate it with the skip trigram. Um, because in and at are different destination tokens that both want to tend to the same source token, keep has to boost either both mine... If keep boosts mine for in, keep must also boost mine for at, and vice versa. Um, and you get this bug. And... Yeah. Uh, again, main emphasis here, figure out why... Get your head around how this illustrates the key limitation that destination can only mediate how much we get information from source rather than what to do when we get it. But yeah. So now we've got a thing on summarizing these matrices. Um, I'm kind of unconvinced by all of this all of the stuff in this section the goal is basically being like these are 50,000 by 50,000 matrices ah what are we doing this is a total mess we don't know how to summarize these um but also they are rank 64 they kind of go via this bottleneck of d head they're like very low rank in some sense uh, what are ways we can factorize or reduce this? And there's a bunch of cute ideas in the appendix about how to efficiently do this um, to get things like a singular value decomposition or a bunch of eigenvalues. And yeah, uh, we focus on understanding copying. And yeah, there is this cute approach with eigenvalues where. Um, I don't think it's worth trying to engage with this in too much detail if you aren't already comfortable with linear algebra, because I don't, basically don't think this generalizes to real models. Um, but the key intuition is if a matrix like the OV circuit, the full OV circuit, is copying, that means it maps vectors to vectors that are similar to themselves. Um, a positive real eigenvalue says there is literally a vector V that maps to a positive real times itself. And if your matrix has a bunch of eigenvalues that are close to positive reals, that suggests that for most vectors, it does something like copy them to scaled versions of themselves. And it's kind of wild, but if you look at the attention heads and their eigenvalues, they tend to cluster around the positive reals, which suggests most things are about copying. Um, and these are like not great as a summary statistic it's like definitely imperfect but it's also just kind of wild that they do this and it definitely seems like clear evidence says like something interesting happening um you know these are probably position heads i don't really know um i can't remember much about the specific model we used for this paper but yeah um, 
to this is random pontificating philosophy about what fully understanding a model means. Um, yes. All right. Now onto two-layer models, which are my favorite models, because they're big enough to be interesting, but small enough that they're not stupidly hard and complicated. It's great. And yeah, key watchword of this section, composition. It's a big deal. And yep, this is the idea I was saying earlier of QK and V composition. Picture to have in your head again, an attention head is like a circuit component with three wires going in, Q, K, and V, and one wire going out. And if two heads compose, you're hooking up the O wire of the earlier one with either the Q wire or the K wire or the V wire of the next one. And this is interesting and cool. Um, and importantly, this composition just like is very different depending on which thing it goes in via. Um, and it's like rough intuitions. You can kind of think of composition as doing something more intelligent than just looking at the naive token value, like integrating in information about the context of the token. So Q composition says, we're going to use context to figure out what the right destination token is. We're going to intelligently figure out where we should be getting information from. Uh, sorry, we're going to intelligently figure out which points should be getting information from a specific source position. K composition says we're going to use context and intelligence to figure out where to get information from. Um, we're going to um, get information from a position, not because of just that token source value, but because of computation and information around that. And V composition says we're going to be intelligent and do some interesting computation around what information to move when we look there. I.e. we're going to move something that's like more meaningful than just what is actually at that position. And importantly, um, Q and K composition are just like super, super different from V composition. Q and K affect the attention pattern, letting it kind of do more complicated things and like be more expressive and do more interesting computation. But like fundamentally, attention only mediates what in how the information is moved, like what information is moved and from which positions, not like what is done with it or what happens afterwards. V composition is just like actually we are rooting more information than just the actual value of the token we're looking at. Um, V composition is kind of harder and more confusing, and I still don't have a great intuition for it, and I have not observed like clear, concrete examples of it. Though there's this super cool paper and submission of iClear called Interruptibility in the Wild that has some evidence of V composition, but yeah. Um, for the purposes of this, we're going to focus on K composition, which again is attending to a token intelligently, taking into account surrounding context of that token. Um, and okay, so this is kind of a monstrosity of an equation. I think I mostly recommend not caring about it. Um, but like key idea here is let's pretend attention patterns are fixed. In that case, the function is purely linear, but where there's like many parts, we can go via the residual stream, via the head and then the residual stream, via the residual stream and then the head, or via multiple heads. And these are just like legitimate things to do that you might care about doing. And these, there's just like this, there's like, n squared pods, n plus 1 squared pods through the model, and each one is basically linear, not counting attention patterns, and you can think of the upper logits as the sum of all of these. And you can break these up into pods that are just via the residual stream, pods that are via one head and then the residual stream, either in layer 1 or layer 2, and pods that are via two heads. And these two head pods correspond to 
uh, V composition. But yeah, you know, I'm basically not going to talk about V composition. Um, and yes, I guess one very yeah. Um, and yes, so this is a lot of algebra. This is a gargantuan tensor product. Um, oh god, there are the rank six tensor products. Uh, okay, I basically recommend not thinking too hard about this section. I think it has extremely bad effort invested per unit insight. The key thing going on here is that the residual stream at like the middle of the model is the sum of the direct path, the embedding, plus the output of each head in layer one. And these are the inputs to the um, attention in layer two. And you can kind of think of the attention pattern for a head in layer two as having the following form. Um, we've got like x1 um, transpose wqk and x1 and you can break down x1 into a sum of the embedded tokens and a sum of the output of all of the heads and that's going to look like this um, yeah that's something kind of fucked about this notation where really we should probably be on the left on the right or something but i don't really care but yeah so yeah uh what this is basically saying is attention um attention pre softmax looks like this x1 is the sum of this thing and this is a t even though it doesn't look like it and um we can just sub in this, and then we get this enormous expansion that is just a function of, and then we can expand this into the sum of a bunch of terms, where each term corresponds to like some path through the model via the attention, via the attention uh, circuit, um, involving possibly involving some attention pattern in um, layer one, but which is otherwise just like a map between tokens and this is just like another illustration of the importance of linearity of the fact that everything was linear meant we could actually do this and yes this entire section is just a horrifying mess of algebra that says that and yes so ah so now we get to an extremely cute idea though i'm extremely biased because this is one of the other bits i came up with so, um, the idea here is, so we're kind of going back to an idea from the start about virtual weights. So, the residual stream is this, like, big, long-running linear thing, and each layer is, like, reading from it and writing from it, and... By looking at the product of the um, writing matrix of thing one and the reading matrix of thing two, we can get a sense for like, I don't know, how much these matrices align versus don't align. And um, you can do this with pairs of attention heads. Um, and so the kind of output um, it's kind of funky because here we've written that everything has like an input and an output set of weights, but actually I would say an attention head kind of has like weights that are simultaneously input and output of W O V and weights that are purely input W Q K. And so what you actually want to get for the composition scores is like um, W 
OV of head 1, and then for K composition, you want to get WQK of head 2. Um, for Q composition, you want to get the transpose of WQK, and for V composition, you want to get WOV2 times WOV1. And these matrices kind of represent, like, how much these are aligned and how much they are composing. But this is kind of fuzzy. Like, every pair of heads is going to be getting some information, like, every head is going to be getting some information from every previous head and every previous time of the residual stream, because reading is just projecting. Every vector is going to be non-trivial. Um, and what's going on is that and so what we want to do is you want to find some way of like summarizing and quantifying how aligned these two matrices are and like how big is that product and uh, the metric we came up with is this thing which basically says I've got two matrices here WQK2 and WOV1 call them A and B and I want to see how much these compose, um, I'm going to take the matrix norm. Uh, this is the Frobenius norm, which is just the sum of squared elements, uh, the square root of the sum of squared elements, just like treat the matrix as a big vector, and divide by the Frobenius norm of each thing. Uh, you can kind of think of this as a generalization of cosine similarity. If A and B are both vectors, then this is just exactly the cosine similarity, or the absolute cosine similarity, because you're dividing their dot product by the norm of each. Um, also note that the dimensions totally work out because this is quadratic while these two are linear. Um, so I think it's worth trying to flesh out why this is a reasonable metric to take, because at first glance it just seems kind of what the fuck. So the first thing is that the denominator kind of just like doesn't really matter. The point of the denominator, like the denominator can just factor through. Really we've got normalized A, where like norm A is just a scalar, times normalized B. And the well, Frobenius norm seems like as good a way of, as any of like figuring out the constant to divide by to normalize a matrix. And so the interesting thing is this claim that the Frobenius norm of the product of two normalized matrices is like a good proxy for how much the two matrices align. Um, note that normalizing is just because like, if you double a head, it should not change the composition scores. Um, and so one naive, naive idea you might have for how much two matrices align is you look at their, um, you look at the basis for the output space of one, you look at the basis for the input space of the other, and you take the dot products and you see how big they are. Like you take the sum of squares of those. And this is a yeah, principled-ish thing you might do, but it the thing it misses out on is that from the perspective of the head, some basis directions are gonna be a lot more important than others. And so um, a more principled thing you can do is using a trick called singular value decomposition, which lets you break down a matrix A into the product of a um, orthogonal matrix U, a diagonal matrix S, and then an uh, orthogonal matrix V, sorry, uh, U and V are orthonormal. You can kind of think of this as choosing a nice basis for the input and output space, such that the function A is literally project inputs onto um, V, scale them, and then project their outputs back into some other basis. And so a times B is instead um, USV times U prime times S prime times V prime. And a fun fact about the sum of squares of a vector or of matrix, matrix is that rotations don't affect it. And multiplying by an orthonormal matrix is just a rotation or a reflection. So the Frobenius norm of this product is the same as the Frobenius norm of getting rid of things on either side. And if you just take a single matrix, um, like A, and think about the Frobenius norm of A, 
there, you just get rid of the U and V, and you're just left with S. And so the Frobenius norm of A is the same as the Frobenius norm of S, which is the square root of the sum of squared singular values, which is like actually a pretty reasonable proxy for like how big a matrix it is. And then the Frobenius norm of the product is saying what is the square root of the sum of squared singular values for the product. And then you're dividing by the square root of the sum of squared singular values for each matrix. And I don't know if you stare at it, it's kind of a reasonable enough equation, though there are kind of a bunch of ways that it's janky, and I've heard some people make credible claims that it might actually be better to take the to instead divide by the dot product of the singular values of A and the singular values of B, rather than the norms. But, yeah, whatever. Um, and a very cute thing is you can just, like, calculate this for every pair of pits. And a thing which I find really exciting about composition scores is that just like an automated metric you can use to look at a model and get some proxy for, like, how much are different bits speaking to each other. And um, you can create a baseline of like how much, sorry, you can create a baseline for like how much are different bits of the model um, composing with each other by just looking at a random model and just saying how much composition is there in that model. And here we've got a diagram where we set things to white if they were at the baseline, and we made them not white if they were above the baseline. And we see clearly standing out are like, two bits of K composition. And it turns out that these are induction heads, and this is a previous token head, and they're K composing. And this is incredibly cute. And also that most heads basically aren't meaningfully composing, and they're mostly just a massive collection of skip trigrams. Um, and yeah, in some sense this is mildly surprising, because having an extra layer is like pretty important, but I think this claim is pretty plausible, but it's just more useful to have way more skip trigrams than to do interesting composition beyond induction heads. Um, and yes, here is an extremely cute uh, visualization of different heads and what they do. Um, I highly recommend screwing around with this kind of thing. There is a great library called PySvelte that lets you make this for your for your own models and i love it and yeah so what this is saying is we can hover over a bit of text and we can see where the head is looking and um so let's just like take this diagram and say okay there's this red head which is composing with these two green heads and a little bit for that one what does this red head and these green heads do can we look at the attention pattern and have any reasonable hypothesis? And when we look at this thing and move it around, we're like, okay, on was, it's mostly attending to the token before. It's some, yeah, it's attending to some mix of the current token and the previous token, basically all of the time. And, yep. Um, note that this is a value-weighted uh, attention pattern view where we take the attention pattern and then we scale everything by the norm of the value vector. Um, this is a kind of janky thing, but it's basically saying um, the head, the OV circuit of the head is able to choose, um, sorry, the OV circuit of the head is able to choose how much information um, it wants to take from any given source token. It's only really going to care about source tokens that are useful. It's also only going to attend to source tokens that are useful. Um, so seeing how useful it considers each given source token is kind of another proxy for like how much that token matters. This is like very rough and very janky. I don't think you should take this as like a deeply principled technique, but a generally core skill to have when doing mechanistic adaptability is just like visualize the confusing mess inside your model and start to build intuitions for what it's doing. And that seems like a somewhat better intuition builder than others. Another thing to note is that looking at the norm of the values is like kind of janky, uh, because as I explained earlier, 
values suck. Values are not intrinsically meaningful. Values are an intermediate th term in the process of calculating a low-rank factorization of a big matrix. And this is kind of fine, because the norm is probably still reasonably meaningful, though something I might try if I want to be a bit more principled, but still efficient, is take the singular value decomposition of the uh, OV matrix and replace the value vector with like what you get via that. But, I don't know. Tangenting. Um, yes, so... Yeah, let's go into this as a mysterious phenomenon. The red head seems to be a current slash previous token head. The amount of information we get kind of varies, but it seems interesting. Um, now, 1, 3 seems like way weirder. Uh, so, this is kind of an average view on everything, and we see that, like, some tokens are attended to a lot. But then we hover over most tokens, it just kind of does nothing. But like, oh, this is interesting. Um, on the token D, it attends a lot to Urs in a previous thing. And Urs is the next token. So this seems like it's sure doing something useful. And it um, turns out that this is a general pattern. Um, the token, the head attends to tokens immediately after previous copies of itself and we call this an induction head and what it's doing is it's just saying um a thing that often happens in text is that there are repeated sequences and repeated sequences are really useful for predicting what might come next because if you just got like i don't know 20 tokens that were repeated and you can tell you're three tokens in. You now just get really, really good scores over the next 17 tokens for free. And this is actually just pretty great. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, this is just, like, actually a very big deal. Um, and a thing that makes two-layer models significantly better than one-layer models. And we have an entire paper about how awesome induction heads are. But... So the induction head is somehow computing this complicated algorithm, and it's somehow doing it by composing with the previous token head. And yeah, head 1.8 is doing similar things. Um, one interesting thing to note is that like this head can totally have bugs. Like here, um, here or oh no, what's a better example? Um, yeah, so here we've got Lee, and we're predicting that was came, it's noticing that was came before. So it's probably going to predict that was comes next. But it's actually apostrophe S. So induction heads can be kind of misleading, but like, still clearly a pretty useful algorithm. And one that's like, actually really important. And, yeah, so the cool thing induction heads do is they look for repeated subsequences and continue them. Of which the like simplest possible form is you got a token, you look for occurrence of it in the past, you look at what comes next, and you predict that what comes next will come next. And yeah, um, so this diagram is showing uh, on the capital D token, it attends to the thing after a previous occurrence of the capital D token, and then the blue thing is saying it is correctly predicting the next token, us, using the thing it attended to. So, uh, if you haven't come across this before, I recommend just, like, pausing and taking a moment now to think about, like, what are the QK and OV circuits of the previous token head and the induction head doing here? And just, like, what's going on? And how would you implement this if you were a transformer? And then there's a pretty solid exercise. Cool. Hey. Right. Um, what's going on? So, I think it's first... Yeah, so we've talked about why induction heads matter. Induction heads are, like, weirdly important to a model. Um, we actually uh, might not have put it in this paper, um, but you can actually just, like, look at the loss curve of a model 
and you see a visible bump where it forms the injection heads just like very suddenly and it actually is sufficiently good that uh let's see it's gonna be a graph in here um yes so uh here is the loss curve of a two layer attentionally model here's the loss curve of a one layer attentionally model they are basically the same and then induction heads happen and the two-layer model does way better. They're like that big a deal. And just to emphasize, like, a movement this big in a loss curve is fucking wild. Uh, that's like really hard and represents a very big part of model performance. So yeah, induction heads are a big deal. Now it's worth thinking about why do one-layer models not have induction heads? What about induction heads is hard? Um, because, like, they're really useful. So, like, presumably one of their models will form as they could. And so the key thing that's going on is that the functional form of attention constrains what attention can do. And in particular, makes it really, really bad at looking at nonlinear interactions of anything apart from the destination and source token. But if you've got something like uh, Dursley, you want to attend from... You want to copy information from the ERS token to the D token. So your source is the ERS and your destination is the D. But you're not doing this because of any relationship between the D and the ERS. You're doing this because of a relationship of the D and the earlier D and because of the ERS and the D. And this involves nonlinear interaction between multiple source tokens and the destination token. And it involves meaningful interaction between the position and this is just like not something a one layer attentionally model is capable of doing um because of the functional form of attention and how that constrains things but this is something it can do with composition and it's worth yeah and like the broad sketch of, sketch of what's going on is conceptually the model is gonna the induction head is gonna have a copying ov circuit it's it's attending to the ers is predicting ERS. So the AV part is just like pretty straightforward. It's just like whatever the embedding is, what the, whatever the embedded token is on the position where I look, predict that comes next. And so the interesting question is how it realizes that it should attend to the ERS token. How it gets the attention working. And the thing that's going on there is that hmm, the thing that's going on there is that the model says, hmm, um, I want to attend to the ERS token. This requires contextual information, namely that it comes after a D. This means I need key composition. Um, and then what happens is the model has a previous has the previous token head on ERS. The previous token head uses its QK circuit to know that it should attend to D. And then it uses its OV circuit to kind of copy D over to ERS, but D is kind of encoded in some special message that the induction head will pick up on. It's not represented the same as it would, uh, it's not represented the same as it would if it was just like the embedded token D. And this means the induction head can tell the difference. And now the QK part of the induction head takes as input the D as the query, and then the K looks for compressed metadata from a on the ERS token, which came from the D, and looks for a match between the query from D and the encoded message that the token before this token was a D. And that lets it do the attention from D to ERS. And I think it is worth reflecting that the hard part of this algorithm is getting the attention right. It's not that the attention was some like trivial thing that was just like a fancy convolution. There was like real meaningful computation going into getting the attention right. And the what to do when you get there bit was trivial in comparison. And yeah. Um, oh, this is a better diagram. Um, but yeah induction heads and 
there's then like a bunch of things we do to like check this is what's actually going on. Um, for the most part, I don't consider this super interesting. The main thing you want to do is you just want to multiply out like um, the three parts. One being the previous token head um, via the positional embeddings, what is the QK circuit on the previous token head? And saying that it does previous tokens. This is also just like pretty obvious empirically. Um, yeah, here are some random tokens so you can like better observe the indexionness, where it just like very cleanly attends to the thing after copies of itself. Um, there's the calculation of the. So yeah, sorry, I should draw a diagram for this. So what we have is we've got. Um, previous token head, induction head, and the key of the induction head is via the previous token head. The query is via the D token. And the um, value uh, comes from the This diagram is a mess. Let me start again. So we've got three tokens. Uh, D, us, and D. And what's going on is there's a previous token head, which has um, goes from D to us. So it's got key from here, query from here, uh, no, it's got query from here, um, key from here, saying, oh, I should look there because of the position. And then the, and then the value comes out via the D. So the output of this head is D. And there's the interesting question of what's the QK circuit and how does it work? And that's kind of a path that terminates here in the interpretable bit of the attention pattern. Then there's the induction head. The induction head also has a query and a key part. The key composes with this, and the query goes to this. And so what's going on is that we have this path via first D to here, and then second D via the OB circuit of the head, and then they both meet and experience the QK circuit. And so the full circuit here is like WE transpose um, W um, OV transpose for the first head, W QK transpose for the second head. and then WD. And this complicated equation represents the like actual composition part of the hard computation of I need to pay attention to the ERS token. And then the final bit is comparatively pretty easy. Um, we move information from the ERS to the output logits. Um, this is just copying. And so if we can verify that the OV circuit of the second head is just copying, we're good. And yeah, uh, we then just do a bunch of checking of this. Um, then there's some other random shit. Uh, this is, um, there's a bit on term importance analysis. I kind of think this is pretty over-engineered and we go way overboard in giving like an actual algorithm and like fussing about how to do this carefully. Uh, the key thing we're doing here is we're basically saying the logits are the sum of the output of every layer, which means they're the sum of the output of every head and of the input tokens. Um, this means that the, yeah, um, yep, the output is just the sum of everything. As a result, this means that um, we can kind of look at the output logits, uh, pair up, connect up the correct logits and like incorrect logits with what the contributions were from each term, 
and then use this to reason about how important each thing was. This is completely trivial if we um, do things in terms of the logits because everything is purely linear. It's not quite, it's not, it's near but not quite linear if you look at log props. And so what we instead do is we look at the full log props and then we delete some group of terms and we look at the change in log props on, and then the change in loss. And all we do here is basically just a bunch of creative ways of like finding different groups to remove. And the main insight is that the layer two heads seem to matter a lot more than the layer one heads and the virtual attention heads basically don't matter. And this is some random cute thoughts on like why virtual attention heads might be really important. I'm, I don't know, I'm not incredibly convinced by this. The main point here is just it lets us route information creatively through the network and there's a combinatorial explosion of different virtual attention heads because for every pair of heads you get a virtual attention head, for every triple of heads you get a virtual attention head, and it's an enormous combinatorial explosion. I'm not convinced that this works out because it seems really hard to use these productively, but I mostly consider this an open question of future research. And yeah. Um, the rest of this I don't think is super interesting. Um, I think the related work is kind of interesting to read on your own. Um, I think the image circuits work is fucking awesome and was a strong inspiration for this. Um, and yep, um, shit is weird. Some of the biggest differences are toy models in language work really well. Um, and heads are like big chunks that contain a ton of parameters and this isn't really a thing with neurons and studying tiny models seems to have gone way better than studying tiny models and images um yep logic lens is cute there's lots of random shit to do with attention patterns um yep yeah the rest of this isn't super interesting um yeah. End paper. Uh, I think that the bonus intuition section is super cute and worth skimming through, um, especially stuff which gives fleshes out what a privileged basis means and what bottleneck activations mean. Um, but yeah, so I guess stopping to reflect on this overly long journey through this paper, what was the point of everything we just did? The point of everything we just did is we want to reverse engineer transformers. And this means we need to like really get what is the functional form of a transformer, mathematically, what is going on, and how can we decompose the model into stuff that is independently meaningful. And we found that transformers were weirdly linear. Most bits of the transformer were bottleneck activations, in particular the residual stream and query keys and values. Um, but there were a few bits that were intrinsically meaningful. Um, inputs, outputs, and attention patterns, and in future, hopefully, MLP activations. And we can try to interpret the bits that are kind of meaningful and not linear, and just treat everything else as breaking down into a bunch of pods between interpretable bits. And we then dug into what the hell is going on in an attention head and found that it has two components. One which is about where to move information from, uh, the QK circuit, which is a low rank factorization of a residual stream by residual stream matrix, and what information to move once you decide to where to look, the OV circuit. These are independent things that can be thought of independently, and the destination token can only moderate where to look, not what to do when you get there, which leads to skip trigram bugs. And it's pretty hard for attention to take into account nonlinear interactions between token value and position, and between anything apart from the source and destination token, which means the main thing you can represent are these skip trigrams. Um, two layer attention only models are way more fun because you get composition. And the main important and exciting composition is induction heads. And 
induction heads are just kind of whack. And they are heads that identify repeated subsequences and try to continue them. And they do lots of weird, clever, intelligent shits using composition. And you can just, like, actually break down the circuit and, like, different end-to-end -end turns. And there's, like, three of them. And they vary in different amounts of sophistication. Uh, and I think that just, like, working through this yourself and really getting your head around it is a pretty solid exercise for, like, actually understanding what's in this paper. And yeah, thank you for coming to this walkthrough of a mathematical framework for transformer circuits. I hope this was helpful. Feedback, extremely welcome. Um, have a great day.